first funny enough starts when I was about five years old. Um, when my grandfather was alive and uh, I'd get to go visit him every weekend, uh, we'd play strategy games on his, his computer. Do you look at uh, the role of Quad in aiding American uh, strategy in countering China through the Pacific Islands? I think as we saw with Prime Minister Modi's recent trip to say Papua New Guinea, for example, and hosting a meeting with many different Pacific Island leaders, I think that's a big sign that India has strong interests in the region. And it's a communist country on the border of China has been fairly open about Chinese military activities in the region. It is, I would argue, I think it's a U.S. interest to see India working more closely in Southeast Asia than, say, Southeast Asia working more closely with China. So, Hi everybody. Uh, we have today Mr. Andrew Hardy with us, who is a research assistant at the Heritage Foundation. Andrew works on U.S.-China strategic competition and Indo-Pacific security strategy, as well as the Oceania, as part of the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation. Envy, we would like to welcome you, uh, who, and you are a young, you know, person in the think tank policy space, you know, upholding American values, American national interest, which is something that we also do in India. We stand for a distinctly Indian take on world affairs, and we stand for, you know, advancing Indian national interest and Indian values. So there is a lot of, you know, not only policy or you know ideological, but also civilizational convergence between the Geostrata and the Heritage Foundation. And uh, we are all young, even so are you. So I think we are primed for a great conversation on you know what can young people do in the think tank space, and also some conversation on you know US and their relations and the periphery of, of it all. So Andrew, I would like to pass over the mic to you, and maybe you could you know share with us your journey in this entire space. And thank you again for making our time to address us. Thank you. Of course. Well, thank you all so much for having me today. It's a, a pleasure to, to speak with fellow young professionals that have a strong interest in international affairs. Um, what I'll be able to do first is I'll, I'll share a bit of bit my story about what inspired me to go into the think tank community and uh, some different background there, and then get more into kind of what day-to-day -day looks like by being a young professional at a think tank, as well as some key tips and tricks that, that I've come across that have been very impactful for my own personal development, but also seeing what helps make someone succeed at a junior level in a think tank. And after that, I know we've got some great questions, so I'll, I'll do my best to keep this remark short and we'll, we'll focus more on uh, the things everyone wants to talk about today. So for, for me, uh, there are a few key parts of my life that really impacted my direction to the think tank community. First, funny enough, starts when I was about five years old. Um, when my grandfather was alive and uh, I'd get to go visit him every weekend, uh, we'd play strategy games on his, his computer. And I'd play that every weekend. I had no idea what I was doing. But as I got older and got more invested in, in these types of games, I really started to realize that I had a strong passion for them and was then building skills through them. It was during COVID-19, while being home from university, that I realized, wait a second, games aren't just games, they give you real life skills. And so from them, I, I just rapidly increased how often I was playing them. It was COVID-19, so I had the time to do so. But it was through those experiences that I really developed a passion for strategy, for big picture thinking, for knowing how to balance multiple things at once, looking at the short term and the long term. And it was through these different computer games that really set for me my foundation. Another big experience that impacted me was when I used to live in Moscow, Russia. Uh, my family and I lived there between 2012 and 2014. And we had to leave early uh, due to uh, Russia's invasion towards Crimea at the time. And that forced us to have two weeks to evacuate back to the United States. That really impacted me. I, I thought I'd had a whole extra year of left of middle school, but everything changed. Went back to the United States, a whole new school. Uh, my school in Russia had 100 kids. And then my class in junior high in America had 1,000 kids. So a gigantic difference for me. And I, I, I had a tough time adapting. So it, would, it was when I was 14 years old, I asked myself, how can I get involved in international affairs and help make sure um, families and children don't have to have their lives uprooted because of international conflict? I quickly assessed that, well, it looks like China's a pretty big country. There's a lot of money going in there. They're also just gigantic. Uh, maybe I should look into China come high school and, and get involved in more speech and debate, which I did for about 11 years total. It was kind of combining all of those things together that made me look into international affairs, into university, 
and I attended the George Washington University here in Washington, D.C., and graduated with two bachelor's degrees. It was through that experience I wanted to go from a diplomat and then shifted more towards security strategy, realizing that when it comes to the People's Republic of China, diplomacy isn't always going to get the job done. And through many of the different internships I took part in, which includes the Heritage Foundation, Hudson Institute, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, both a intern and staff member on Capitol Hill, these different experiences helped shape my worldview and gave me the real life practical skills needed to make an impact right away. So these, all, these experiences all the way back from five years old until where I am today as a 22 year old have significantly impacted my career path, my interests and what I hope to make an impact in down the road. So that's kind of the overall influence that has impacted me going forward. Why does, how do think tanks fit into this for me? Well, first, it was through a, a lot of speech and debate experiences and having to do a bunch of research and on-the-fly activities that helped me realize that think tanks produce very valuable resources that we can all use to get a stronger awareness of international affairs, different perspectives from different people in different administrations, different backgrounds. It was very helpful for me. And so while at GW, when I was in different internships and different networking programs, I was involved with the Heritage Foundation very early on, within two weeks of arriving on campus. And so from that background, it really got me interested into being more involved and learning more about the think tank community. Additionally, as I went through my studies, I realized with my knack and passion for strategy, my passion for international affairs, and wanting to think big picture, I realized that the think tank route is one that would be a very strong interest to me. The ability to be sitting in the room with people who have been there, done that. Uh, with, the, with Heritage, a lot of more from, say, the more conservative administrations to get a sense of what is it like to have conservative public policy at the highest levels possible. I always like to push myself. I like to challenge myself. And so for to be in that opportunity and to, to learn from many people, that to me was a really compelling reason to be involved with think tanks. Additionally, I had a growing passion into China and U.S.-China strategic competition, and I realized that that think tanks were one of the, of course, the thought leaders, it's in the name, uh, to be leading research when it comes to these core questions that impact us not only today, but years ahead. And I wanted to have a role in that. Uh, I had no idea what that role would look like, but I knew down the road, if I'm wanting to have an impact on public policy, starting at a think tank would be a really cool place to be. So as I was looking for the job hunt uh, come near the last uh, semester of my undergraduate degree uh, this past fall, I started applying for different positions and a role at the Heritage Foundation opened up. Uh, as a prior intern there, I chatted with the team and we were able to, to get an interview. And after that, it was up to me to, to get the job done. And thankfully, it all worked out quite well. So from there, that's kind of led to that interest into think tanks. And really, I've been absolutely enjoying the opportunity to be there. So what does it look like now day to day? So for me, I'm in our Asian Studies Center. So it's in the name. You can take a guess what we look at. And for me, my specific role as a research assistant means I am generally, well, I am for my team, the youngest member of my team by at least 10 or so years, <laughs> uh, which means I have a lot of administrative responsibilities. And this is something I think many young professionals don't think about all the time that when you are 22 or in your early 20s and you're looking for research opportunities and research assistant roles and think tanks, you can't go in thinking that you're going to be the next big thought leader right away. It's, it's not how it works. There was one time where I thought that at first. Um, it's not how it happens. Uh, there's a, many different responsibilities that you don't immediately practice for when you're an intern. So when I was an intern doing a lot of research opportunities and different projects, but now I'm over here booking conference rooms. I'm over here working on different contracts with different projects we're working on. I'm over here making sure that budgets are put together. We're collaborating with members of my team to make sure we're on budget for different projects, uh, looking at different scripts for different events we want to host for other people. A lot of behind the scenes work. When Heritage's Asian Study Center hosts a public event, which we have one on July 11th, and then we have another on July 20th with the celebrating the U.S. ROK Alliance, as well as the Pacific Island Co Compact Agreements coming up soon. You know, I have, I generally have a role in that and helping make sure these events become a reality. So it's those types of things that don't always get talked about, I think, when you're thinking of, oh, I want to be involved in the think tank. But at that junior level, those are some of the core responsibilities to help make sure your team can operate, as especially at a place like Heritage, to where we have some of 
I'd argue, I mean, in my strong opinion, some of the best scholars in the country with some of the most experience in their different fields, they're, whole, they're gonna be the thought leaders. They're the ones who have actually crafted the legislation that impact US policy. They're the ones that work on executive orders that work with our defense department, state department, treasury. They're the ones who've been there, done that. So it's my job to assist them. And that includes more than just research. Now, thankfully for me and for my team, uh, my boss, his name is Jeff Smith. Many of you may know his, his Twitter is at Cold Peace. Uh, he loves, he's a big India guy. And, uh, you know, learning from him has been awesome. And he's a really, really good person as well to where he's willingly given me some, some opportunities to, to lead some research. So at Heritage, I help lead our efforts on the Pacific Islands. Uh, when I came out of undergrad, I had no idea that I would even be looking at this region. I, some of the countries were very new to me, but his willingness to trust me in that as a research assistant is, is very unique, but also very treasured. And it's an opportunity I take very seriously and want to give my absolute best to. So for that, there are different, there are some research abilities that are opportunities that are made available, but it's not right away. It's not, you're not entitled to them. You, you got to work for them. So that's kind of what some of the general things I'll look at every day can look different. Sometimes I'll come in with a calendar and it's got nothing on it. And then it's filled up with 20 different small tasks. Uh, sometimes it's tasks I really want to do. Sometimes it's tasks that I would rather not do, but I know I have to. So th there, there are some things that it's just going with the flow, but then contributing to long-term research, medium-term research. I have an intern that I, I manage and I supervise. And so making sure she has tasks that are delegated to her. Um, you know, those are some of the daily things that, that I work with and uh, really enjoy. So a few key things to keep in mind before we turn it over to questions quickly is some of the key traits and tips that I, I think are important for those who want to be involved, say, in a, think, in a national high-level think tank um, that, that is a full, you get paid for it too. It's pretty nice. So first is don't take anything for granted. I've learned that the hard way. But I think it's very true when it comes to think tanks, and especially as a junior staffer, that you're going to be given tasks that you probably don't always want to do. But it's through those opportunities that you need to be appreciative of it. Because A, it, it means you have, you, know, you're, you're, you have a job, you're being paid for this that other people probably want. So you need to make sure you remain humble and just appreciative of the opportunity to be there and the ability to contribute to a team. B, it also means you know, learn what you can from those opportunities. Maybe there could easily be something that you never thought you would learn, but you really do through those types of tasks. When I was an intern with Hudson Institute, I was in charge with my scholar. I was helping with her scheduling and expense forms. I had no idea why I was doing that all the time, but she trusted me to do it, wanted me to do it. And it turned out to be one of the most impactful experiences I had as I'm coming in as a full-time staff member in a think tank. I'm now able to immediately help with different scheduling, conference services, work with my boss and my team to make sure everyone has what they need when it comes to their expenses and when it comes to scheduling things for them. That's a very important trait that most people learn on the job when they start at a think tank. Uh, but I had the privilege of coming in with at least some background in that. So making sure you don't take those opportunities or people for granted as when you make relationships, don't just build connections with them, build relationships with them. You really want to make sure you form strong bonds with people and make sure you know them as a human being, not just in their employee role, but also as who they who they are, what their passions are, and how y'all can help each other and grow as better people and contribute to great work. All around, I think not taking things for granted is very important. The next thing is to work hard. That's an easy thing to say, but it really does go a long way. Whenever I'm given opportunities, I always do my best to give 120% on it. Is A, Again, there are other people that probably want to do that same thing. So I need to be appreciative of having that opportunity. But I also need to show that those who give me uh, opportunities and trust me with things, that they can trust me with that, that I'm able to deliver for what they're looking for. So things like that, you know, if you're working very hard, you're doing your best to learn something, you remain humble, you remain open-minded. And if someone gives you a task, they know that you're going to give it your best, even if there are mistakes, even if there are different things that you, you need to, 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 to grow with and learn from. That type of work, it builds a reputation, and it really goes a long way for how people trust trust in you and look at you down the road. So always give it your absolute best and working hard at what opportunities are presented to you, and people are able to take, to take notice. The final thing I think I mentioned uh, is to 
a nice piece of advice I received that I still live by today. And I remember it's, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. That line was, I learned that when I was, a, when I was 19, <laughs> I was at Heritage actually for a career panel. Uh, and that line is really impactful to me because it really does make you think that you, know, you, you could think you're doing this great job and you can say, oh, you know, I, I, I've chatted with this person before, or, or I, I've, I'm connected with this person. But, you know, if y'all haven't actually built that relationship before, then how is that other person really going to be viewing you instead? You know, it's it's very true that you want to have you know good good recommendations when you're applying for jobs, especially at think tanks. It, it does matter having the people there to support you. And for me, when I was applying for Heritage, I, I just reached out to a whole bunch of people that I did my best to develop relationships with and said, "Hey, there's an opportunity here. If you think I'm well suited for it, I would you know love to talk more about it. Love to get your insights about it. I'd love to see how I can make myself the best candidate for this role." I'm not asking for, oh, can you give me a recommendation? No, it's if you want to give me that, I appreciate it. But I want to learn from you. I want to build that relationship with you and make sure that they know me. I just don't know them. So I think something like that, as you know, for, for those who want to go into, into say, different uh, think tanks and, and making the biggest impact they can as a young professional, by it's don't just think about I know XYZ people, but make sure XYZ people know you. And I think that really does go a long way when applying for jobs and when even kind of down the road as well, when you're building relationships and other opportunities pop up, that could be very impactful as well. So hopefully that provides a, a kind of a background as to, to why I love this industry. I, I really do have a passion as you know, this stuff is personal for me from what I experienced when I was about 13 or 14. Um, that that really was an impactful time for me. So everything I do is it's I genuinely am passionate for what I do, and uh, hopefully that day to day background and some tips there can can help in your own passions and your own dreams. And uh, looking towards for those interested in the think tank community, uh, hopefully there are some pieces of advice there. I'm looking forward to getting the questions, and I'm also very happy to have so many academy folks here as well. Um, I did the academy myself in the summer of 2021, so it's great to see how it's progressed internationally, and I'm really really grateful to 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 answer some questions now. Thank you, Andrew, for you know putting forth your entire trajectory of you being a five-year-old, listening to grandpa's stories, accounts, and then coming up to a, you know, a foundation as reputed as a latest foundation. And sort of we hope that people amongst your audience also find some resonance with what you have said and also about you know the work ethic that and the and the Enormity of work that is required when you enter a space like policy and impactism. Uh, you know, it's about creating an impact that resonates with the person who assigns you something and also to appreciate the work and the opportunities that come your way, uh, which is, of course, a very important observation. And we would note that. Uh, going forward, uh, we would welcome questions from the heritage fellows slash members of Geostrata. Uh, so we can start with Darshan since you have your hand raised. Hello, hello, Andrew. First of all, I'm really thrilled by the talk. And my question is, uh, you know, can you give us an overview uh, of the role of the think tanks, for example, like Heritage Foundation, in shaping uh, policy and public opinion in the United States? Uh, how do you think this role has evolved over time? Of course. I think that I think that's a, a good question to ask. There are there are many different types of think tanks, at least here in, in the United States and I'm sure around the world. But I'll, I'll focus on the U.S. Uh, think tanks. So at least with Heritage, um, you know, Heritage is the leading conservative think tank in at least the United States and dare we say around the world when it comes to thinking of what is kind of a U.S. perspective towards conservatism. We also gauge the mood of American conserva conservatives quite well. Uh, heritage, we focus a lot more on kind of the everyday American in the sense that we we have over 500,000 people that donate to the Heritage Foundation. That can range from a few dollars range to larger gifts, but we want to make sure we get an accurate assessment of what do American people feel about key issues that impact them. And so in that case, you know, we can break that down to different types of think tanks to where, say, Heritage is an advocacy think tank. We're very focused on, say, impacting Capitol Hill. We are just a few blocks away from Capitol Hill. We want to see our research translate into different legislative victories and, and different policy changes. But say a group like Brookings Institution or Hudson Institute or the American Enterprise Institute, they're more of what I would say as research tanks. 
to where their focus is kind of like a, it's a university without students uh, to where you have very smart scholars who are there producing quality works. And it still does impact public policy, but it's not say as, as forward leaning as I'd say as an advocacy tank is like heritage. You also then have contract tanks such as Rand Corporation to where a lot of their, uh, the vast majority of their work comes from say contracts from, from say the government or different individuals or different uh, groups to produce certain research that, um, that people want to see. So I think uh, over time that this can change based off the current political environment um, for, for some, I mean, also it's just current events as well. So different, I know for heritage, for example, we, we like to be very responsive to current events. And we also wanna make sure we're aware of what uh, our different members think. We wanna make sure what American conservatives have in mind and make sure we are addressing the key issues that come to their mind. So at Heritage, we have seven strategic priorities that are in line with some of the biggest concerns that our, uh, cons our different members uh, focus on. And so that can, can sometimes change where there's a big issue we got to cover on, then we'll, we'll, we'll look a little more into that when it comes to our research. But those different roles and different think tanks serve the public in different ways. We, every different think tank, however, will publish different reports. At Heritage, we'll do hundreds of reports. We'll do thousands of different media hits, whether that's radio, television, podcasts, different interviews. So we're, we want to make sure we have heritage staff members going out to the community, sharing perspectives and making an impact on people, not only in the United States, but kind of like today in a way of internationally and making sure we're engaging different groups, either whether it's kind of governments, whether we're working with different, different types of, uh, of officials or whether it's working with, with fellow like-minded uh, younger professionals about making sure people are aware of what think tanks can do and how they can impact people. So there are some things that can change over time, but a lot of the same messages and same intentions uh, over time that they stay the same. Hope that answers you, Darshan. Uh, if there are any next questions, please go ahead. Yes, Arthur. So hi Andrew. So my question is, uh, how do national level think tanks like Heritage contribute to public's understanding of complex international relations? For example, U.S. China uh, and U.S. India. Yeah. So we, I'd say there are two main ways we we try to to impact this. So first is through our publications. So it's very easy for think tanks to do very long papers. Uh, for example, the Asian Studies Center, we just released a big paper titled Winning the New Cold War, A Plan for Countering China. That was all the way back in March. That was about a 130 or 40 page report. So for that, we are targeting different interest groups who want to pick apart parts of the report, or we want to work with members on the Hill to make sure they're aware of what we recommend. Uh, that's kind of you know, that main audience. But we also realize that not everyone wants to read through 140 pages of stuff. So we have, additionally, we have smaller things like policy memos, issue briefs that are more so of say, you know, two pages or four pages. And that way it's a quick read within a few minutes to get a general sense of an issue and what heritage things needs to be done about a particular issue. So those things, we take those complex issues that yes, or can be found in hundred page reports, but then we want to narrow it into more smaller issues or more digestible issues such as uh, fact sheets, such as issue briefs that just hit a particular issue, give you the top line, give you brief data, and then here's a one or two key recommendations we want to see. So when Heritage was younger, a, a, a few decades ago, there was a, a test, kind of the brief book test, or briefcase test, if I remember correctly. Oh, it looks like things are frozen. Uh, I think it's fine. Oh, okay. Maybe it's just my screen then. Okay, we'll keep going. If something's off, just let me know. <laughs> um, but we we have a um, the, the the brief book test, which was to make sure if a member of Congress wanted to know an issue, kind of heritage would be able to have a quick sheet that they could look front and back and get a general sense of what the issue is and what needs to be done about it. So something like that is what we think about of taking complex issues and making it digestible. So also social media, I think, is a big deal to where it's. We have hundreds of thousands of different followers across a variety of different um, variety of different platforms. So, say Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. We we like to make sure we're hitting a wide variety uh, of groups. And so, with that, we then take those two page to four page things that have already brought down or simplified a hundred page reports, 
And then now we're doing it in 200 characters or 150 characters or a video. I've done a few uh, camera videos or two what we call straight to cam videos of where I'll just sit in our comms room, we'll have a script and we'll break something down. We did that recently, say with the, uh, the news that China is helping build a new spy facility in Cuba. So things like that, we then try to break it down and communicate it to every audience. So Heritage, especially, we're very good at doing our best to communicate with those. If, if you're just following us on social media, then if you're a policymaker, we want to make sure all that audience is hit. And we, we hope we can then break issues down like U.S.-China relations, U.S.-India relations into very digestible formats that anyone can enjoy at any type of level. Thank you, Andrew. That actually clears a lot of doubts. Great. Thank you, Fatuk. Uh, next questions. Yes, Anusha. Hi, Andrew. It was great listening to you. So, you know, you said that you're the youngest researcher, research assistant at Heritage Academy. So my question to you would be, from your experience at Heritage, right, how can think tanks encourage and foster professional development of their young staff? Yeah, so Heritage does, they, they do a great job with this, um, I would say, in the sense that Heritage really does value the different staff members that they have. You can be the president of the Heritage Foundation. You can be, say, someone like me, who's a, a very new research assistant. And what Heritage attempts to do, they, they, they do a few key things that I think impacts us the most. So first is, in my team specifically, the Asian Studies Center, we have just very high quality people and so for me, that professional development happens every day when I'm interacting with them. And so that can come from sitting in research projects with them and learning about the key issues that they're focusing on. Say it's COVID-19, say it's U.S.-India relations, say it's U.S.-China relations, say we're looking at Korea, Japan, to where I am in the room being the biggest sponge I can be. Now, I consider that professional development as it means every day I'm learning something new. And even if I'm not talking or contributing, I'm seeing how it's done. I'm looking at the people who have been there, done that, communicating with counterparts at the highest level possible. So for me, it sets a standard. It sets this is, if I want to make an, a big impact one day, I need to do my best to listen closely and follow what they do and incorporate that into my own activities. So that to me, I think every day there's a professional development, especially with, with my team that I enjoy learning from every day. It also means we get to contribute to research. And so having knowing the highest levels and highest qualities of research that's available, the Heritage Foundation, again, it sets a standard that I know I need to be achieving for every day. So if I, as a 22-year-old, am doing my best to write as if I'm a 62-year-old, that I think carries me a long, very, decades in advance of here's what I'm supposed to be doing if I want to make the impact one day that I hope to see. The second thing, there is more kind of actual focused things on young professionals. So there can be young professional events. Uh, I know I'm with a group of some of the younger members of our Davis Institute of National Security and Foreign Policy. We'll do a few different breakfast events. We'll do a few different lunch events. I'm also in a fellowship called the George C. Marshall Fellowship that takes some more younger to mid-career uh, military and security focused uh, staffers. And we kind of listen from different May, big, big scholars that'll come in and give us insights for an hour and a half over dinner about their experiences and key issues. So those types of things to where I'm actively inserting myself and being involved in these programs and just once again, being a sponge, asking questions, being involved uh, as much as I can be. Another thing I think that's important is managing interns. So I have an intern every semester. I hire, I review intern at resumes. I do interviews. I hire interns. That to me is also pretty impactful as someone who's 22. To my current intern, I believe she may be older than me, which is a big deal because that means you know I need to make sure I'm doing the very best I can with, with someone who wants to, to learn at Heritage, someone who wants to, to work with us. Got to make sure that she has the best experience possible. That's on to me as a supervisor. It doesn't matter if I'm 22 or I'm 52. I got to make sure that I am, I've got someone who reports to me and I need to make sure she's got the work she needs to get done, that she has my approvals, she knows her projects, she knows how she will make an impact every single day as well. So that to me is, I think, very helpful for me. And it also helps me mature very quickly that I need to make sure that I am once again, matching everything that she could ask for. And then as we work to get all our future interns together, I learn from the experiences and know how can I be the best supervisor? 
as again, in maybe 10, 20, 30 years, if I'm going to be in some type of supervisory role myself, I think it's good I'm starting now with one person before I get to a whole big team. So that I think is an interesting aspect of professional development that Heritage offers and that I had the privilege of, of you know, doing my best to, to hopefully impact another person's life that I've gone through myself. The other thing I'd also mention some educational opportunities. Heritage is very happy to see their younger staffers look towards graduate education. And so that to me, I think is something that I'm very interested in. And they're happy to work to see which is the best master's opportunity that can exist, uh, the best way to get a degree in DC while still working with heritage throughout that. So going to school, but then also getting paid and working at the same time. I think that's really great to have two hats on. It really forces you to work very, very hard as you're balancing a course load as well as uh, your, your everyday work activities. So there are also some opportunities that I think uh, really provide that professional development from day one. And once again, I think it goes back to what we mentioned earlier about working hard. You want to make sure you work hard with all those opportunities and never take it for granted and take things extremely seriously as I think that's how you get the most out of it and you really gain the most from it. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's some great advice. Of course. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, uh, Anusha. We move to Bhavish Shatal. You have your hand raised. Hello, Andrew. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your personal tips uh, to uh, for a person to en uh, enter uh, into a career uh, and think tank career. And my question is, uh, how can young professionals make a meaningful impact within a think tank? And are there any specific strategies or approaches that you would like to recommend uh, for establishing oneself as a thought leader? Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I think that there are a few things uh, to that. A few, I think a few things I may have touched on a little earlier, but I think it's it's always good to come back to them. I think the very first thing is mentioned before is to work hard. Um, that to me, I think is that's number one. As think of it this way, there for junior for the entry level research roles, especially at big think tanks in Washington, hundreds of people, if not thousands, apply for them. So the, generally, there is less or around a 1% chance and arguably a less than 1% chance for some key roles to get your foot in the door. It's very little odds. <laughs> and so with that, it's you know, one way to kind of set yourself out is making it very clear through before you're applying for those roles that you've had various internship experiences, that you took advantage of your college experiences, that you weren't just doing classes all the time. You were actively, say, being with the Geostrata, for example, and publishing. If you're actively publishing, doing events in the academy, those types of things let employers see and do those who review your resume that you are working very hard outside of just what you have to do, say, to earn a degree. That, I think, right away gets you uh, kind of looked at very quickly. But then as you're in a think tank, you then need to remember that hundreds of people may have applied for this role. So I better make it very clear this is not the wrong decision. So keeping that in your mind and knowing that you know, you, that doesn't mean you have to be a perfectionist and one mistake means you're out the door. That's not the case. You got to be careful with that. But it is important to know that if you feel like you can just slack, if you feel like I've made it, I'm at the think tank, I'm going to publish this article and I'm good, you're not going to be good for very long. I'll tell you that. It's DC, especially, it's a, it's a, it's a very tough town. It, it's cutthroat. For many Amer any American who wants to study like international affairs or go to national policy, there's mainly one city to do that, and that's Washington, DC. So with that, that's where that working hard becomes very clear. And it's the minimum that if you don't do that, then I don't care what the GPA is. I don't care what your past experiences are. You're not going to cut it. It's, that's the hard truth. I'll tell you, that's hopefully that advice is it's, you know, well received there. That's, that is the hard truth. You've got to work hard. That's just the start to make an impact. And so that is the cornerstone of any specific strategy, especially when you're young, there aren't too many opportunities that come along to lead certain research. And so if that opportunity ever comes around, you have to work extremely hard to make the most of it. So when I do my research channel on the Pacific Islands and help different events, help different op-eds go out, you know, that, that's something I take extremely seriously and I'm going to work as hard as I can on that. So when opportunities do exist, take them, as especially as a junior staffer, they'll generally go to the more senior staffers. So there have been two times where someone from our media team said, hey, this publication is looking for someone to write on this topic. Is anyone interested? 
I'll see if any senior scholars take it. There were two times where they didn't. So I said, I'll do it. I'll write it over the weekend. Give me, give me two days. Give me Saturday and Sunday. I'll put it out. And two of my articles came just because someone asked for it. No one else wanted it. So I fought for it. Those types of things, when those opportunities come, you absolutely work hard to receive them and then do your best to then prove that this is the right call for you to have that responsibility. But kind of with that, as well as to be patient too, that you know, there are no entitlements. When you're coming in as a junior staffer at a think tank, you know, there we will, we are not thought leaders. We assist the thought leaders. And over by doing the best job to assist them, then over time you build the experience where people then go to you for questions, then people go to you for your advice. And so kind of remaining humble in that sense and knowing that it takes a long time to get there. I think that's very helpful as then whenever I think about how can I help my team, it's always very team oriented. It's not what can I do to get this X, Y, and Z thing. It's how can I help my team? And then generally my team, they like to include me in on that and see that I can provide valuable contributions. So with those things like that, I think that's how as a young professional, you make the biggest impact is working as hard as you can, taking every task seriously. I don't care if it means you're refilling coffee or moving books around, you take it seriously. Do the best job you absolutely can on that. As those things, while maybe you can't deliver an end product, maybe you can't say publish an op-ed for say, you know, cleaning up a room or helping set an event up. Those are the things that go unspoken but carry a long way because then it sets a character, it sets your reputation, it lets people trust you more. And so kind of taking those baby steps and just being open to what opportunities are thrown your way and being patient before a big break happens, that will therefore put you in the place to succeed when those strategies pop up. And so I kind of something I, I like to call, it's a put me in coach mentality. I played high school American football for, for one year. And there was one, one time where I was put, I was promoted to the starting defense. And the guy who I benched that day, he decided to run onto the field himself for practice. He was not going to let me take his job. And coach looked at me, he said, you're going to just let him take your job. Okay. Then that was it for a good hour. I sat on the sideline while the guy I benched was now playing in my spot. So from that experience, I now kind of take that approach of put me in coach about if there's an opportunity, I'm gonna fight for it. If there is a way that I can make an impact, I'm going to do it. That doesn't mean you push elbows. It doesn't mean you bring people down. It means that people want to bring you up and they offer you the ability to do that. You give it 120%. And that mentality for me, that's, that specific mentality, I think has really helped me produce a lot of work quickly, has helped me make impacts for my team, has helped my team be as efficient as we can be. We work together and collaborate well together. It's, it's through that approach for me that makes a difference. So hopefully that, that thinking of you know, working hard, doing your job, taking opportunities when they're presented to you, and then being patient while waiting for them, that I think has made the biggest impact for me, and then puts you in the position to ultimately be that thought leader. And I'll also know, feel free, we can, we have a, feel free, we can go on until 9.15 if y'all would like to. Um, I, I know we had the, the, the mix up with the calendar for a bit there, so, so feel free, a few more questions, happy to keep going through that. For you, Andrew, uh, you know, working hard. Uh, I mean, these are principles which also force us at the Zero Strata to burn the midnight oil and, you know, keep at it. So, and I'm sure we are working you hard with all of these stream of questions. So, yeah, loving it. <laughs> I think we'll just take two more questions. So, who's next? Deepika, yes. Uh, hello. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking us through your insightful journey. And I'm sure it has left all of us deeply enriched by your valuable perspectives. So my question to you would be that uh, based on your experience, what are some of the prevalent perspectives on US-China relations among the academic community in American universities? And how do these perspectives compare to those with the ones in think tanks? This it's a really interesting question. Um, as so, when I was at the Elliott School for GW, I took at least six or seven different China-focused courses, and it it isn't. It's interesting to see as there are there is a variety of different professors. Um, I know some of them that I've taken courses with. They have kind of looked at the evidence, and they've been teaching for decades, and they look at the evidence and assess that the. China is not the, the friendly panda that we thought it would be. 
um, kind of the, the panda hugging is, is the term uh, that, that's been used before, um, to where many professors have looked at this relationship and looked at China's actions, uh, not only mainly in more of a foreign policy perspective, but but they they consider this to be very concerning to, to U.S. interests and that U.S. strategy has to change. It is more of a confrontational, more of an adversarial relationship. Now, there are different factors of that. Some may say we're just in competition. At Heritage, we like to say we are that we do view China as an adversary. We say we're in a new Cold War. Some professors won't go that far. So there are some varieties there, but overall, the professors and students, there has been a shift as of, say, five, 10 years ago, uh, more so looking at the relationship through a lens of competition. Now, that isn't always the case. I've had some professors that still focus, they still think we should try to engage where we can. They acknowledge that there's been some military, well, of course, military buildups, but more of kind of a, a competitive perspective towards things. But they're still more willing to say, if we can cooperate on, say, environmental issues, we should prioritize that. Some professors will still do that. Others I've taken, they just say, ah, it's just not going to happen. Students are also in the United States, especially in, say, George Washington, for example, they're, they are more willing to have that more collaborative approach. They're a little more interested in, in working with China where we can, but, but that number is not, it does, it is fluctuating. There, is, there are more students who are more willing to view things competitively um, when, when, when just looking on the evidence. So when looking at, say, the think tank world, um, I would say overall think tanks are a little more hawkish than, say, college students are. I think, especially at Heritage, we, we definitely are a China hawk-focused uh, think tank, I think it's fair to say. Uh, we, we very much so look at U.S.-China strategic competition. We, we don't really view China in a favorable lens, especially with the different actions they've done, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but here in the United States. There are so, this is something I've learned a lot in my past few months at Heritage, is that China's conducted many different activities within the United States that should just be completely unacceptable, whether it's overseas police stations, whether it's the ability to um, try to influence our own internal policies, whether it's different lobbying efforts, higher education influence, purchasing landings to military bases. There, there are some things that you just check a list and thinking that this cannot be a healthy relationship. So I think we at Heritage for sure have identified that and we believe we're right, uh, but there are others that may have different, different perspectives. I know different, uh, also it's interesting to think of think tanks as some think tanks have, one, uh, we have a one voice policy at Heritage, which means everything that we will publicly state, we say it as a team. Uh, we say that this is kind of our, our institutional position on X issue. That's not the case with every think tank. Say for example, at Hudson Institute, uh, they do not have a one voice policy. It, it is more so of, they've, they have kind of common values. They have a common vision that they want to see, but, but each scholar, they, a lot of times they'll do their own thing, uh, that they'll have their own research initiatives they take on and they have their own articles and positions that they'll take on things that are say consistent with, with Hudson principles, but they can vary, they can disagree on things publicly. So that's also, I think, something to look at when we think of think tanks and the different perspectives on U.S.-China relations is that uh, we, there is a general trend towards that hawkish approach, but get into the weeds of it. Look at individual people, identify individual people, go past just the name of the think tank and look at, say, you know, don't just look at what does Heritage say. Also look at what does Heritage Asian Study Center say or what does Heritage Center for National Defense say? Same thing with Hudson, what do, not, not just what, what does Hudson Institute say, but also what does Hudson Institute China Center say? Over at uh, Brookings, for example, they also have a, a China Center along those lines as well. So it's, what does not just Brookings say, but Brookings China Center say? As that, I think, gives a more nuanced perspective of what the, the thought leaders in those think tanks think about those issues. And then with kind of thinking of drawing back to professors, to where professors, they also do different interviews for media. They will at times publish their own op-eds. So that's a way to kind of see their views outside the classroom and see what they bring into the classroom as well to get a sense of where that is. So I think that the trajectory is more so of a, a hawkish stance towards China, thinking it more in competitive perspectives, uh, but it can fluctuate and you just got to dig in to find uh, the different fluctuations. Thank you so much, Bill. Of course. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we move on to Samed next. Uh, it was nice to have a conversation with you. Uh, 
thank you for all the advice i would like to introduce myself first i am the uh, team leader of covering china that's a, a vertical that we have at geostrata and i've read the entire report that 140 page report that you are referring to how to win the next cold war i will keep my question short my question regards to how do you look at uh, the role of quad in aiding american uh, strategy in countering china through the pacific islands how do you see the role of quad uh, engaging with the pacific islands going forward so I, I think the Quad has a strong role to play with the Pacific Islands. I think, as we saw with Prime Minister Modi's recent trip to, say, Papua New Guinea, for example, and hosting and meeting with many different Pacific Island leaders, I think that's a big sign that India has strong interest in the region. And it's, I, I do, I'm someone who believes that presence matters, that trips matter. And so, for example, I, I wrote an article when President Biden was supposed to fly out to Papua New Guinea and sign a defense agreement or elevate a defense agreement with them following the domestic U.S. debt ceiling uh, uh, issues, he had to miss the meeting. And so that to me, I, I, okay, debt ceiling matters, that's fair, but there are consequences to that. And so you know, there was a lot of debate, I know beforehand to where initially it was just going to be Prime Minister Modi, and then Biden's coming, and then Biden doesn't come. It's like, well, what is going on here? But you know, th that I'm glad that India, in a way, was able to get a good spotlight with, say, Papua New Guinea. And then as well as I think there was a 10 point plan or multi-point plan that was rolled out as well for how India wants to engage in the Pacific Islands. That, and they also, the, the proposals in there were very concrete and in the direct interest of Pacific Island countries. So things like that, I think are very important for not only India to take, but the quad at large. So the United States has a strong interest in the Pacific Islands. I know heritage is very big. We wanna see the Compact of Free Association Agreements are, uh, funded and passed by Congress. And that's where our, our July 20th event will be popping on. So here's my plug, come and watch it live. I'll have Ambassador Yoon joining us and Jeff will be moderating that. But seeing the United States actively involved in the region, making sure that it's treated appropriately. We can't just think of US-China relations as say Taiwan and South China Sea. Way bigger than that. It's Oceania, it's Indian Ocean. It's, it's this entire, it's why we have this big term of Indo-Pacific. So having the countries involved in the region, I think it's important. This could look at more of say, different types of defense cooperation in the region. I think the United States has a unique agreements with say Marshall Islands, uh, the uh, Palau with Micronesia. I think that's pretty set in stone there. We see Australia has been now reaching out to help improve different defense agreements in there. But outside of that, or cooperation agreements, say security training, but outside of that, there's also say different economic initiatives. I know the Japan, Australia, and the US were able to help provide funding for different uh, fiber undersea cables that help provide internet, and different technology communications to, to, the, uh, to the islands and fund that. That's a gigantic deal with critical infrastructure that these islands rely on to make sure they are literally plugged into international affairs. So different projects like that, I think, exist for the Quad. I know the Quad is more so like a military-focused kind of grouping, but there are elements that, I mean, national security, economic security interact with one another. And so seeing the countries work more in the region to do that, I think is absolutely in the Quad's interest. But it's also important to know that there, it, there can be differences. Um, the U.S. and Australia view the Pacific Islands in different senses at times. It's not as unified as, as, as we may think. We may think, oh, America and Australia are buddy-buddy, good to go. It's, it's not the case of that region. And so as the Quad works together, it's important to keep in mind that there will be different interests in the region, that there are different perspectives over how the region should operate. And also, we have to listen to what the Pacific Island countries themselves want. We can't just come in and frame things as Quad versus China. It's not a selling argument. It's part of an argument, but not the selling argument. And so when the quad countries work with these island countries, we need to make sure that we are meeting them where they need to be met with. That doesn't mean you know, we, we put all of our chips on, on the table and kind of just cough up the, the coffin or the coffer here, but um, you know, work together with these countries that they can agree with and build long-term partnerships with them to where China does not have the ability to then have to gain a foothold in. We know China is attempting to have different influence operations in the region. They're trying to flip different countries that recognize Taiwan to flip over to China. They will throw money at these islands. They throw bribes at these islands. Solomon Islands is a big deal, big example. A heritage in April hosted Daniel Sudani uh, for a public event as well to talk about what China is doing in the Solomon Islands. He's a former Solomon Island lawmaker that was pushed out 
because he opposed the one China policy. So something like that, you know, we don't want to see that happening in other Pacific Island countries. So the more the Quad can cooperate in the Pacific Islands, the best it serves our interests, the best it can serve Pacific Island interests, and we'll have to get through the granular details of that. But I think there's a common threat that unifies us for sure of countering China, as well as similar democratic values that wanting to see a free and open into Pacific that Pacific, Pacific Island countries can latch onto as well. So hopefully, I, I think that's what I, I see is possible, and I think we should all be working towards as well. I would like to uh, tell you that we in India look at the China question through the same lens that you mentioned earlier, uh, that diplomacy is the only solution. So it mm -hmm. would be uh, an honor for us to work together uh, through Geostrata and uh, Heritage, deepening this partnership. Thank you. Well, we're, of course, we're always happy to, to, to chat and to, to see where we can go. Thank, Thank you. For uh, Andrew, if you have time, we just have one last uh, very pertinent question or so. Yes, I can, I can take the last two questions. That should work for me. Okay, so the last question would be Vaibha. Okay, thank you, Ashish, and thank you, Mr. Harding, for like accommodating one more question. So, like uh, the previous question that you answered, which one was by Sumed, was how US does have a united front to act against China, the Chinese. But what we have witnessed in, in India, that is all that China also is also working on a united front, which is like a lot of books that I've read is the 100, 100 year marathon or the hidden hand talk about how Chinese are also gathering a united front in the Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific region. So how does the US view that and how does the US India partnership moves ahead from that? Towards you said the to Southeast Asia? Yes. So I, I think so Southeast Asia, it, it's, a, it's an interesting region that it, I think the U.S. should be more involved in the region, but it's also very difficult to sometimes find ways to collaborate in the region um, in the sense that you know, we all know ASEAN centrality, that is the key component that ASEAN holds very true to. And so the, ASEAN likes to do its best from kind of a U.S. perspective to where it, it'll hedge at times, it'll balance to where... They don't want to be drawn into a conflict with the United States between China and the United States. They don't want to have a big issue, say, blare up over Taiwan, South China Sea. They, they want to be as out of it as they can to where they don't have their own national interest being negatively impacted, which in a way makes sense. If I'm a Southeast Asian country, I also don't want to be brought into a, a big war between great powers. However, they're also willing to play the economic card. And they're willing to collaborate with China. They're willing to let Chinese investment come into the country, BRI projects. And so for the United States, it's an interesting debate about how much do we engage Southeast Asia? And then how much do we say pressure Southeast Asia? Uh, there's a great article in the, uh, by Z Dr. Zach Cooper and Dr. Hal Brands in the Texas, Texas Public Policy Review that actually looks at this issue of how should the US work with its allies when it comes to Indo-Pacific? And they kind of form these two schools of thought together about how can we both balance engagement and some more pressure tactics to secure U.S. interests. And that it's an ongoing debate that I don't think it's we're always going to get very right. Um, there are we have very common interests with Southeast Asia in the sense of wanting to push back on China, and that's of course an Indian interest as well. And given U.S. freedom navigation operations, maintaining a relatively safe South China Sea, you know. Those, they love the US for that. They love the United States having that security presence in the region. But then economically, they'll lean a little more to China, geographic reasons as to why, get it. So when we look forward as to how the US can be more involved in Southeast Asia, you know, I, I, and working with India especially, I think the, key, the core thing is an economic approach. I think there's already a military approach that's fairly well established. Um, the caveat maybe is say South China Sea and uh, Chinese vessels going into EEZs. Uh, that cannot be normalized. It is legal for different vessels to go into EEZs, but if, they're, if Chinese vessels are just going in without notifying countries, it's very blatantly just a disrespect slap in the face. Um, if you're building up militarized islands in the South China Sea, that also is unacceptable, as well as you're going to say, try to challenge disputed territories, which that's a whole nother can of worms of figuring out all the different disputed territories in the region. So I think military-wise, the more the U.S. can maintain a presence in the region, I think countries already like that where the Indian U.S. can make progress in is more of an economic front and directly to counter what China's approach is. 
China's approach more so is the state state uh, state owned enterprise approach to where the state can just direct companies to go into X country, do X project, and no questions asked. They'll fill for the money, they'll take care of debts, just you're going to go do it. With a more free market approach, it's, well, there has to be demand, there has to be profit to be made, it's a private company investment, the, the state doesn't really do, U.S. government won't do much at all, it's, it's primarily the private enterprises that do that. So, I think it's good to have free enterprise involved. I think that's the most efficient way to build the best economic partnerships. But it does pose a problem versus a Chinese government-backed strategy, as well as, again, the geography. So I think geographically, India can play an interesting role for Indian companies and their interest in possibly expanding more to, to Southeast Asia, to where now you've got to where countries, can, instead of having to be reliant on China, India can provide some of those different types of products that countries looking for, different types of factories to look at, different types of high-end technology to look at, to where rather than having to rely on China for key goods, India provides those goods as well. Additionally, I think then the U.S. can also be involved with different companies that can, as time goes on, get more involved uh, in the region. Uh, it's going to take a little more of a push to go there. U.S. companies for decades have been like banking on China, have significant investments in China. So and we get that. You can't just wave a magic wand and off everyone goes from China to Southeast Asia. We, we acknowledge that. But we also don't think you, you just accept that. you got to there's the kind of more decoupling, French shoring, near shoring, those different fun terms to encourage that happening. So in order for, I think, Southeast Asia countries to align best with U.S. Indian interests is if we can provide the economic alternative to what China currently possesses. It allows the Southeast Asian countries to feel less coerced and less pressured by China when it comes to balancing U.S.-China-based great power competition relations. If we can do that, it also, I think then Southeast Asia countries can be more publicly aligned with Indian perspectives, more aligned with US perspectives, more willing to take a tough stance, more willing to um, not have to be overly reliant on China and gives both of our countries, I think, a very strong coalition of allies and partners that are very opposed to what China is doing. Maybe look at even the, the Vietnam, a communist country on the border of China has been fairly open about Chinese military activities in the region. They're a little more quiet on the economic front, get that. But if they're willing to get a little more vocal about China's military efforts right, on the, right across in their waters, I mean, that, that's, that tells me that if we could just give them another opportunity, they, they just might take it. They just might be interested in it. So if, US, if the US and India can collaborate more on that front, or even just as the US does things separately, even India is doing things in their own interests. It is. I would argue, I think it's in U.S. interest to see India working more closely with Southeast Asia than, say, Southeast Asia working more closely with China. So even if collaboration is difficult to do, say, at a public-private level or private-private-public-public public level, uh, as long as the countries can collaborate, either collaborate together or just work concurrently alongside each other, that I think is best for both countries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harding, for that. I think hawkish relations with China are something both India and U.S., uh, share in common. Yes. So thank you so much, Andrew, for your you know interaction with all of us, and it's nice to see that dialogue between you know United States of America and Indian youth is rising, and this you know platform between the Heritage uh, Foundation and the Geostrata is an exemplary example uh, of that. So we'll try to have more such discussions and series. So please stay in touch with us. Uh, to our audience and uh, from all the youth of India to you and to you. Namaste and thank you so much for interacting with us. Thank you so well, much. Thank, thank you. Arden. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Truly a pleasure to have joined y'all today in the Geostrata today. Uh, it was wonderful questions. I think we had a wonderful conversation and and ho hopefully some of the words that were shared today can be impactful as, as everyone goes on their own professional development and their own trajectories and uh, really have, happy we're able to have the call today. And please looking forward to, to how we can, can keep chatting in the future and how we can, can keep helping each other out. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew.